Picture this, two aircraft with virtually identical specifications. Same speed, same range, same bomb load. Yet by war's end, statistics revealed a shocking truth. One proved more than 80% more effective than the other. How is this possible? What lies behind these numbers? And most importantly, what stories of human courage stand behind the cold data of wartime statistics? The story began in the mid-1930s, when American military planners recognized the need for long-range heavy bombers capable of defending the homeland from distant threats. Boeing answered this call with the Model 299, which would evolve into the legendary B-17. A reporter, witnessing the prototype bristling with machine guns, exclaimed it looked like a flying fortress, and the name stuck. The B-17 Flying Fortress was an impressive machine. Measuring 74 feet 9 inches in length with a wingspan just under 104 feet, it was powered by four Wright Cyclone R, 1,820 engines, each producing 1,200 horsepower. With a maximum speed of 300 mbph and a service ceiling of 35,000 feet, it could deliver 6,000 pounds of bombs over distances of 2,000 miles. But its true innovation lay in its defensive armament, up to 13.50 caliber machine guns positioned in carefully designed firing positions to create overlapping fields of fire. Meanwhile, consolidated aircraft believed they could do better. Drawing on their expertise with flying boats, they designed the B-24 Liberator around David R. Davis's revolutionary wing design. Davis had worked backwards from the ideal teardrop shape, creating an airfoil that allowed air pressure to drop gradually over the wing's surface reducing drag and increasing efficiency. This meant the B-24 could fly faster and further than the B-17, though its smaller wing area forced it to operate at lower altitudes. By the numbers, the B-24 seemed superior. It was faster, had longer range, and could carry the same bomb load. Yet the wartime statistics tell a dramatically different story. To understand the true difference between these aircraft, we must look beyond specifications to the human stories of those who flew them. Consider the extraordinary tale of 2nd Lieutenant Glenn Rojan and his B-17, the Little Skipper. It was New Year's Eve, 1944. Rojan and co-pilot 2nd Lieutenant William Leake were approaching Hamburg in a formation of 60 flying fortresses when German flak erupted beneath them. The target area ahead was a hellscape of exploding aircraft and black smoke. When Rojan saw the smoke signal over the docks, he knew it was time. Confirm when bombs away, he radioed to Bombardier Sergeant James Shirley. Bombs away, came the reply as a stream of 500 pounders plummeted toward the earth. But as they turned for home, disaster struck. A formation of German MEE-262 jets screamed through their ranks, followed by swarms of BF-109s and FW-190s. In the chaos that followed, the lead B-17-9 lives suffered a direct hit to its cockpit, killing both pilots instantly. Yet somehow the aircraft continued flying straight, but not level. What happened next defies belief. At 12.44, nine lives crashed into the little skipper from below, its structure piercing through Rojan's aircraft like a massive arrow. The two planes became locked together, what co-pilot Leek would later describe as mating dragonflies. In the ball turret of the little skipper, Corporal Joe Russo found himself trapped as twisted metal clamped his position shut. Over the intercom, his crewmates heard him begin to pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Leek later recalled, I could not help him, and I felt that I was somehow invading his right to be alone. He removed his helmet, giving Russo privacy for his final prayers. Meanwhile, in an incredible display of airmanship, Rojan and Leek managed to control the descent of both locked aircraft, using only engine power and their combined strength on the controls. With flames spreading across their wing, and ammunition cooking off around them, they performed the impossible. They turned the paired aircraft back toward land so their crew could bail out. When Leek had his final chance to jump, he refused Rojan's direct order. I'm staying, Glenn, he said, knowing that Rojan couldn't control both planes alone. The crash that followed destroyed nine lives instantly, catapulting the little skipper forward in a violent cartwheel before she finally came to rest. Miraculously, both pilots survived with only cuts and bruises. Of the crews from both aircraft, 10 men lived through the ordeal, a testament to both the B-17's structural integrity and the extraordinary skill of her pilots. If Rojan's story seems incredible, consider the tale of First Lieutenant Ewald Swanson and his B-17 Misper. On July 14, 1944, Swanson was leading his crew on a mission to Budapest when German flak found its mark. 
An 88 mm shell scored a direct hit on the nose of his fortress, instantly vaporizing the bombardier and navigator while completely destroying the cockpit. Any normal aircraft would have been doomed, but this was a flying fortress and Swanson was no ordinary pilot. Despite having no cockpit, no control column, and no instruments, he regained control of the aircraft. How? His crew began manually pulling the exposed control cables by hand, literally flying the aircraft through teamwork and determination. For 10 terrifying minutes, they nursed the crippled bomber away from the target area. When a second flak burst destroyed an engine, Swanson made the hardest decision of his life. He ordered his crew to bail out while he held the aircraft steady. Seven men successfully escaped before the B-17 began its final, uncontrollable climb. Swanson waited until the very last moment, jumping just as the aircraft stalled. His parachute caught on the torn metal of what had been his cockpit, ripping through the fabric, but this damage paradoxically saved his life as an intact chute would have dragged him down with the aircraft. He crashed through the canopy of a dense forest, suffering a broken leg but surviving against all odds. Incredibly, all eight crew members of Misper survived the mission and were reunited at the same POW camp. They endured nine months of captivity before liberation in April, 1945. These stories of extraordinary courage illuminate the mystery of those wartime statistics. When we examine the data, the truth becomes clear. Efficiency wasn't just about aircraft specifications, it was about survivability, controllability, and the human factor. The European theater data shows that for every 100 sorties, 1.32 B-17s were lost compared to 1.7 B-24s, a 30% higher loss rate for the Liberator. The reasons were multiple and telling. The B-24's advanced wing design, while more efficient, made it significantly more difficult to control and far more vulnerable to battle damage. A hit to either of the two main wing spars could cause catastrophic structural failure, while the B-17's more conventional wing design could absorb tremendous punishment and continue flying. The accuracy statistics were equally revealing. B-17s consistently place more bombs within 1,000 feet of their targets, despite flying higher and in larger formations, factors that should have reduced accuracy. The B-24's handling characteristics made it harder to fly in tight formation and more tiring for pilots, leading to decreased bombing precision. Most critically, the B-17's forgiving flight characteristics and robust construction meant that crews like Rojans and Swansons could survive encounters that would have been fatal in other aircraft. The 15th Air Force reported that B-17's dropped 192.5 tons of bombs for each aircraft loss, while B-24's managed only 106.5 tons, that stunning 80% difference in efficiency. But efficiency statistics, however dramatic, only tell part of the story. These aircraft carried young men, average age just 22, into some of the most dangerous skies in history. The B-17's reputation for bringing its crews home earned it a special place in their hearts. Tales of fortresses returning with tails blown off, engines destroyed, and massive holes in their fuselage became legendary. The Norden bomb site, installed in both aircraft, was touted as being able to drop a bomb in a pickle barrel, but the reality of combat proved far different. Flying straight and level for the bombing run made these aircraft sitting ducks for fleek and fighters. It was in these moments of maximum vulnerability that the B-17's superior design characteristics proved most valuable. As the war drew to a close, both aircraft had written their names in history. The B-24 Liberator, despite its vulnerabilities over Europe, proved invaluable in the Pacific Theater and the Battle of the Atlantic, where its superior range made it the preferred choice. Over 18,000 Liberators were built, making it the most produced American bomber of the war. The B-17 Flying Fortress, with nearly 13,000 produced, became the symbol of American air power over Europe. Its crew's survival stories, like those of Rojan and Swanson, became the stuff of legend. These weren't just statistics. They were testaments to human courage, engineering excellence, and the indomitable spirit of young men who climbed into aluminum tubes and flew them into hell.